Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Now it is safe to say that the International Monetary Fund solely governs Sri Lanka's economy. They're basically the masters of our economic destiny. Even though our government is trying to showcase that everything is hagitory, history dictates that these policies uh, proposed by the IMF will not make us economically independent but more of a subservient state to big economies. If you still think that we will be like Singapore, well, you can forget about it. Because to even get closer to being an economy like Singapore, this methodology of letting organizations like the IMF, whose allegiance is basically to the United States, dictate our destination is something that we need to do away with. When a country seeks financial aid from the IMF, they are typically required to implement certain measures known as conditionalities, which is exactly what we are currently experiencing. These conditions aim to stabilize the country's economy, but can often have detrimental effects on its citizens. These condition conditionalities have often resulted in austerity measures, reducing uh, social spending, job losses, and increased poverty. Sounds familiar, isn't it? This can undermine the very foundation of a developing nation like ours, progress, making it hard for us to achieve long-term sustainable growth. While the IMF uh, provides short-term assistance to countries in need, the conditions attached to their loans prioritize repayment over the well-being of citizens. This approach can perpetuate an endless cycle of debt for those countries, hindering their ability to invest in healthcare, education, and infrastructure. However, for our Colombo liberal idiot class, IMF is the savior. If the IMF is such a pro in fixing economies, my question is, why are they then proposing very harmful solutions to nations like ours? And joining me now via Zoom all the way from Seattle is a member of the Seattle City Council economic uh, economist, uh, Sharma Savant. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, now, madam, the IMF program is in full effect in Sri Lanka, and we have seen a bit of calm in the economic crisis. According to a liberal economist, it indicates that these policies are working. In your opinion, is that the case? Mahesh, it's so important that you ask this question because uh, whatever so-called calm that might exist for a moment is completely superficial and uh, we should not allow it to mask the intense economic crisis that the masses in Sri Lanka continue to face and we know from the history of the IMF that country after country after country in the neo-colonial world, nation after nation, has been further decimated through the policies of the IMF. And in fact, if you look at what happened last year with the um, just really inspiring and courageous revolutionary movement, including the general strikes that happened in Sri Lanka, we had millions of people marching in, on the streets, hundreds of thousands of plantation workers, tens of, tens of thousands of workers from the free trade zone factories, public transportation workers, teachers, health workers, bank employees, workers at the ports, fishermen. I mean, you name it, and that occupation was represented in this revolt against the long-standing crisis and then the major economic collapse that had happened in the nation because of the cost of living crisis. Uh, but Sri Lanka is hardly alone in this situation. We, In fact, even in the just the same region, we are seeing Pakistan in complete crisis and chaos. We're seeing crises in countries like Bangladesh and Nepal. And, you know, uh, uh, my home country, India, where we have seen general strike after general strike against many of the policies of the Modi regime, including the exacerbating uh, economic collapse due to the cost of living crisis. And so while the IMF says that they're doing de debt restructuring and they say this is a lifeline, in reality, it is going to send the nation into a further debt spiral. You know, right now you have half of Sri Lankan families buying food on credit. And now through the IMF policies, the government has announced reducing salaries in public service agencies, eliminating subsidies for food and fuel. None of this is going to solve the problem. Understood. Now, Madam, now, organizations like the IMF and the World Bank were created purely for American dominance back in, uh, you know, in the 50s or the 40s, I believe. But that America no longer exists. There is an entirely different uh, America right now. 
So why are these harmful policies being pushed when there is a better way to have trade dealings uh, that will allow America to thrive with many nations and its people? As you correctly indicated, Mahesh, this is a new world era that we are in and the superpower of American capitalism that existed a while ago does not exist in the same way as it did before. It is a weakened power, same with China. China is a weakened power. But at the same time, the reason we see these uh, these very exploitative policies from organizations like the IMF and the World Bank continue to be thrust upon poor nations is because we still have the dominant system. I mean, glo- capitalism I- is what runs global society. And as long as we have the global capitalism in place, we are going to see Western and powerful financial powers. And, and I don't mean ordinary people in America. I'm talking about the billionaire class in America, the billionaire class in Europe. They are going to continue to exploit. And they do. They carry out a two-fold exploitation. You know, there, there's exploitation and economic suffering of the mass of American population. You know, mass of American workers don't benefit from these policies. The masses of European working class don't benefit from the policies of the IMF. But who does benefit? It's the wealthiest people in the world. And we should not forget that even a country like India has its own homegrown capitalist class. And it's in its own right, it's an imperialist power. And it's an imperialist power regionally. And in fact, in the new world order that is emerging, India is being groomed as an ally of the US side as a bulwark against China. So we are going to see further imperialist policies being driven, of course, not to mention the war in Ukraine. And so in in this context of capitalism and imperialist war, we're not going to see any different than the past in terms of the exploitation of the people in neocolonial nations. So that's why we need uh, really fundamental alternatives to capitalism. Indeed. Uh, well, we have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you. That was the member of the Seattle City Council economist, Sharma Samant. A short break now. We'll be back in a moment.